This is CBC Here and Now. CBC speaks with the man who found a toddler who wandered away from her daycare. I didn't see no one walking around looking for. Pamela Asprey was last seen in 1984. The hope is there, like there's something, maybe, maybe she's alive. Lots of repairs needed and no money to repair. Hope you don't need to lift your boat in Burgio. It is a big safety concern. Hard court battle. The top teams in the league go head to head at mile one. This is the most important part of the season because we're trying to we're trying to lock in that home court advantage. Well, winds continue to be the major player on the weatherboard over the next couple of days, though easing as we roll throughout the day on Wednesday, a calmer Thursday into Friday, and then a system brewing for the weekend. Well, let's get to our top story, and it is a frightening one. Imagine you drop off your toddler to daycare, and then you figure out that the child has wandered into a street all alone. It happened to a family in St. John's last week. Tonight, they are saying the daycare deserves more than a slap on the wrist. Here now, Zach Gowdy has the details. Did they know she was missing? I don't believe they, they did. I don't believe they did know that she was missing. Danielle Douglas still can't believe it happened. Her two-year-old niece wandered off from daycare and into the street without being noticed. She was able to push through a gate, uh, which wasn't latched appropriately, uh, and no one witnessed her uh, exit through the gate uh, and exit the premises. The premises is Discovery Days Daycare Centre in Kilbride. Neighbour Gordy Kennedy noticed a child on the steps of the house across the street, alone. What was the girl doing when you saw her? Said no, bone up in her little corner there. Frozen. Just by herself? Yeah. Was she doing anything? Did she have anything with her? No, she had her hat on, didn't even, wasn't tied off. She had her gloves, wasn't on. And, that, and I brought her over, got out of the car and brought her over. Kennedy quickly realized where the girl was supposed to be. When you uh, brought them back over, what did they say to you at the daycare center? Oh, uh, one missus said tanks. And the other one missus was on her cell phone. <laughs> Were they looking for her already? Did they know she was missing? No, nope. I didn't see no one walking around looking for her. Based on security camera footage, the girl had been gone for approximately 15 minutes. No charges are being laid, but the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development has issued violation orders regarding the supervision of children at all times and for a malfunctioning gate latch. The girl's family says that's not enough. It's a parent's worst nightmare you know, um, certainly accidents can happen. Uh, failure to supervise a child and put their health and safety at risk is intolerable. I don't think uh, that uh, this, there should be any room uh, for an incident like this to happen again. Calls to Discovery Day's daycare center have not been returned. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls is preparing to hold hearings in this province. The Commission will be in Happy Valley Goose Bay tomorrow and Thursday. It will be the first time for families in this province to share their stories of violence and loss. Here now is Carolyn Stokes reports on what we can expect. Staff here at the St. John's Native Friendship Centre have been helping families register to testify. Over the next two days, those families will lay bare painful memories about their loved ones, Indigenous women and girls whose lives ended with violence. Around two dozen families are expected to testify at this hotel in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but many of them have chosen to tell their stories in private instead of during a public hearing. One of the people who will be testifying is Charlotte Wolfrey, whose 21-year-old daughter Deidre was killed by her partner in a murder-suicide in Rigolette in 1993. Hoping that what we're doing here is going to bring about change and that it's going to make a difference. Otherwise, I don't think anyone would want to open up all those pains and go there again. As we've seen at the inquiry in other provinces, the families will have support. Amelia Reimer of the Native Friendship Centre says that support will be both emotional and cultural. Well, we use the uh, Inuit oil lamp, the hulik, as part of the ceremony. We also use the First Nations medicines to do smudging and uh, we use song um, 
to provide whatever it is that family needs. And those families in Labrador will be adding their voices to the other 763 people who have already testified. And today, the National Inquiry said it needs more time to do its job. It asked the federal government for a two-year extension, hoping to give even more families a chance to come forward. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. The Delta Hotel in St. John's has lost the contract to exclusively provide food and beverage service for the convention center just next door. According to sources, City Hall has awarded a new contract to an American-based company, Centerplate, which is based in Stamford, Connecticut. City officials aren't commenting on the change, but the formal announcement may come as early as this week. Clients of legal aid will soon have a tougher time getting a private practice lawyer. The province says it will amend legislation to remove that option. Although the legal aid director will have the authority to appoint one in extenuating circumstances. Government says it's costing legal aid too much money and that could impact other services. Still with provincial politics, the Liberal government will prorogue the current session of the House of Assembly next Monday. And then on Tuesday, March the 13th, the Lieutenant Governor will, re will read the speech from the throne. The provincial budget is expected sometime in late March or early April. An East Coast set designer has snagged an Oscar for his work on The Shape of Water, a film that cleaned up at Sunday's Academy Awards. It's the second time Shane Vio has worked with Mexican director Guillermo del Toro. Vio is originally from Dartmouth, but attended Memorial University on a swimming scholarship in the 1980s. He even lived with former mayor Shani Duff during his time here. He described those years as the best time of his life in an interview with the St. John's Morning Show and said St. John's is one of the warmest cities in the country. Vio's back in Toronto now working on the set of Shem of Shazam, an upcoming blockbuster for DC Comics. That's a pretty big congratulations. What a oh, isn't that sure. fantastic? Fabulous. I can't yeah. wait to see that movie, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> He did say he spent a lot of his time uh, at university sort of socializing more than studying, so it's good to see all that paid off. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. right. Uh, time to take a look at the weather, yeah. but there's also something interesting. Yeah, we are going to have a look at a little video of this furry tourist who strolled into town today. Roxanne Payton in St. Lunaire Gricket on the Northern Peninsula posted this to her Facebook page this morning. And she says, uh, yeah, she spotted this polar bear wow. in the area around 7 a.m. Right, so of course uh, she did what we all do when we spot a 300 pound polar bear wandering from yard to yard. She grabbed a <laughs> phone and decided to shoot this video. She felt safe enough because yep. she was inside. Roxanne says bears are usually around the northern peninsula this time of year because of the ice along the coastline. She says when you live by the ocean, you expect to see a polar bear passing through, especially with that ice flow coming from the north. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess it's worth pointing out the town of St. Anthony only about 28 kilometers away, and it quickly sent out a media release warning people uh, about the uh, presence of this bear. Cute, yeah. from a, cute from a distance. Absolutely, you want to definitely take uh, take your uh, keep your distance from uh, from a bear like that. She says uh, shortly after she snapped the picture, took the video, uh, the bear left. Now, where as she alluded to, ice, ice along the coastline. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's really a highway now for the polar bears to come right down the coast, and we hope that. That's about as far north or south as they'll come. When you take a look at this ice map, again, it extends all the way down the coast. And a lot like last year, where we were seeing bears all the way down, polar bears all the way down towards the Bonavista Peninsula. Uh, and of course, that always does not end well. So uh, hopefully those bears won't be coming any, anywhere further south. But there's an updated look at that ice map, which again, that ice extends all the way down that north coast. Thanks to those driving northeasterlies, which do continue through tonight and tomorrow, although easing through the day tomorrow. Watch your timeline here. Those gusts tapering off from the 70, 80 kilometer per hour range, which we've been seeing for the southeast half of the island to more 50 and 60 as we roll into the Wednesday afternoon time period. May even see some sun breaking through the clouds uh, tomorrow afternoon for places along the northeast coast, including St. John's. We'll talk about that coming up more in your forecast. Uh, and a quick look ahead into Thursday when this area of high pressure off to the north sinks down. Winds really becoming lighter. Thursday, one of the nicest days in the forecast, the calm before the mess. And uh, we'll talk about the weekend situation coming up a little bit later. 
And of course, tonight, tomorrow and the next day in full detail in just a few minutes, Anthony. All right, hopefully Ryan's forecast won't disrupt what's happening in the big land. We're going to go to Kane's Quest now, where snowmobile racers are moving at a record pace. The leading teams arrived at Happy Valley Goose Bay this morning, where excited fans greeted them all. As here and now's Jacob Barker reports, many spectators were there to see the team that is currently in second place, the Innu Hawks. Well, it's hard to keep up with these guys. They're moving faster than they've ever moved before. <laughs> The real show here today wasn't the arrival of the first place team, but rather the team that's been giving them a run for their money since the beginning of the race. Fans from Natwashish and just up the road in Sheshashi came out to show their support for the Innu Hawks. The Innu Hawks! I uh, want to uh, congratulate them on their, uh, their, their race uh, so far. We haven't slept uh, most of the night, so we're focusing on the, the King Quest. <laughs> yeah. Tired but determined. How is your body holding up, first of all? Right now I like to go take a shower <laughs> and uh, go to bed. I see dead people. <laughs> <laughs> they appreciate all the support they've been getting. Like a whole lot of strength for us right now. At times they have been at the front of the pack, Having dropped back to second place, they want to get back in the lead. We're going to stick to our track, full speed, I guess. <laughs> Close on their tail has been Team 88. They're hoping to spoil the party and take over the Hawks, who right now have an eight-minute lead. They better put the hammer down. We just gained almost an hour from uh, Lance and Claire, so yeah, they're going to see our red lights uh, not long after we leave here. While that race is going on, the leaders, Team 22, are enjoying an hour and a half long lead. And talk about fast, organizers are now saying instead of a Friday finish, they're planning for a Wednesday morning finish that's two full days early. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. What a great experience, yeah, hey? Yeah, record speed, looks great, <laughs> everyone's having a great time, it's good for them. Well, the St. John's Edge have a tough four games ahead of them against two of the best teams in the National Basketball League. Tonight, the team plays the Halifax Hurricanes in the first of uh, two game series, and the London Lightning are here this weekend. Mm -hmm. Some tough uh, basketball ahead, but many people are still buzzing about Carl English's 58-point yeah. performance on Saturday night. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is at Mile One Center this evening, and he joins us now live. Jeremy, just put this in some context. How big a deal was it for English to rack up that many points in, in just one game? It's not very often that the NBL gets mentioned on an NBA broadcast, but that's exactly what happened on Sunday night. You see, Carl's former coach with Team Canada is Leo Routens, who's currently a commentator for the Toronto Raptors. So during the Sunday night broadcast, he showed some St. John's Edge highlights and talked about the record-breaking performance. Now here is Carl himself in action as he put up those record-breaking 58 points. He played 38 of the game's 48 minutes, which is not too bad for a 37-year-old. He dropped 11 three-pointers and hit 13 of 14 free throws. The team was quick to celebrate the record-breaking event, but for the man behind it, it was all about the win. It was fun. I mean, the most important thing is we got that win. It was the second game of a very grueling back-to-back, -back, uh, very physical team. Um, but it was fun, got going early and uh, hit some shots and then uh, kept that flow going right through. And it was, uh, it was nice, like I said, to get the win and, and to break a record along doing it. So English and his teammates will be playing here on the court behind us in about 47 minutes against the Halifax Hurricanes. And if they win tonight, they'll then be in a first place tie in the Central Division with the London Lightning. And speaking of London, like you guys said, they'll be here for games on Saturday and Sunday. Now to help us explain how important those games are, we're going to be joined by associate coach Steve Marcus coming up later on in the show. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Mile One Centre in St. John's. Look forward to it, uh, Jeremy. So Carl English racking up the points like yeah. that. I bet you there'll be a lot more right. people watching. It's hard to games. believe when they were bringing the team, Debbie. They were saying they were hoping to get 2,000 fans, and they got 4,000. So yeah. it's fantastic. fantastic to see the team doing so well. It is. Carl English, a big draw. <laughs> She got into a car in downtown St. John's 34 years ago and has been missing ever since. Last scene, a new series on Here and Now. That's next.
There's perhaps nothing more painful than the disappearance of a loved one, knowing they've met with death. And sometimes questions are never answered. This is the story of a young woman who vanished from downtown St. John's and whose disappearance has passed through hands of investigators for decades without any new leads. Tonight, Here and Now's Arianna Kellen brings you episode one of a new series you'll be seeing on Here and Now. This is Last Scene. A mild Monday night, Pamela Asprey is just shy of 20 years old. Her Mona Lisa smile has a twinkle. Her frame is tiny, but those who knew her say she was fearless. On this night, Pamela told her friends she'd be back to the bar in 20 minutes. 20 minutes turned to hours, then days, now decades. Pamela did enter the vehicle uh, sometime after 9 o'clock p.m. on November 12, 1984, and Pamela has not been seen or heard of since that particular time. Truthfully, I think she's dead. Really? What do you think happened? I know I say someone was some maniac or something got her. The hope is there, like there's something that maybe, maybe she's alive. of Pamela Asprey begins in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The third of six kids, Pamela left home after her father died in 1981. For years, she hitchhiked her way between Newfoundland, the Maritimes, and Winnipeg. Unafraid, untouchable. No matter what trouble she was in, she came to me. She hitchhiked from ha Goose Bay I don't know how many times. <laughs> Pamela Asprey eventually did return to St. John's, the city where she was last seen. If she was alive, she would be back to me now. That's, that's the only thing that tells me that something's happened to her. A roommate advised that Pamela left to walk to the downtown core of St. John's. This lady, as well as other persons that we've interviewed, made us aware that her mode of transportation was primarily hitchhiking. So she would hitchhike from her residence in East End uh, to downtown. In fact, uh, we've identified one of the persons who picked her up that evening, just a short distance from her residence, and dropped her off in the area of uh, Martin's Lounge, uh, downtown St. John's. Martin's Lounge, Water Street. Today, it's Erin's Pub. Pamela had a few drinks, then told her friends she'd be right back. Perhaps she was so certain of that, Pamela left this behind. A day planner, a calendar, a debit card. She left Martin's Lounge and walked to the War Memorial on Duckworth Street. Pamela told her friends she was meeting a man, a man unknown to her. He was likely a John. Pamela Asprey was a sex worker. A blue vehicle pulled up. Pamela got inside and it drove off. Well, she didn't show up Monday night, she didn't show up Tuesday night, and Wednesday morning, I think 8 o'clock, I called her, please. It wasn't until weeks later that Pamela's disappearance was public. A small paragraph in the evening telegram sandwiched between letters to Santa and Christmas sales. The girl could have left the province, of course, without telling anybody that she was, that she was leaving. She left herself open for various types of activities. And uh, a girl of that nature uh, always causes some concern. And, uh, of course, in the back of our minds, there, there may be foul play suspected. Her disappearance came after a string of Christmas time tragedies in St. John's. First, 17 year old Sharon Drover went missing in 1978. Two years later, schoolgirl Dana Bradley was found dead. 
Inuit student Henrietta Millick vanished the following year. Pamela Asprey was next, but police say there is no evidence today to suggest they're connected. Throughout the years, this file has passed through many investigators. Now it's in Inspector Tom Warren's hands. Since this file has been assigned to me, we've continued to investigate uh, who owned that particular vehicle, looking at people that would have hung out in that area on the night in question. That particular aspect of this investigation is still very active. It's possible the man in that car killed her. But is it possible to find him 34 years later? It's also possible she was just dropped off. Lots of possibilities. In Pine Glen, New Brunswick, those possibilities are too painful for Alice LaFergie. No matter what she did, that was fine. I loved her and my love for her was unconditional. My looking for her is unconditional and I don't think it'll stop until the day I die. Every November, LaFergie writes a Facebook post about her missing niece. Maybe someone will see it. Maybe someone knows who did it. Whoever killed her, I would like them to know that they took someone of value. She wasn't garbage. She was a valuable person. In my life and in brothers' and sisters' lives, may God have mercy on their soul. I forgive them. That's hard, but I do. Fishing boats have to come out of the water to be inspected every year. Well, that's a problem because the Burgio boat lift needs major repairs.
Direct Weather Forecast has been brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. So we've been talking about the lack of snow, certainly for our area this winter, and yeah. uh, you have the numbers. Yeah, that's to prove right. It. Yeah, a little low in the in the snowfall accumulation, so a good time to uh, do a few of the numbers and uh, check back on where we're at. Um, again, we are looking for the snow all winter here in the east, and on the other side of the map, places like the Not Straits the and Goose Bay. I mean, they are uh, wondering still where to put it if there are, uh, you know, in terms of how much more is on the way. So the numbers on the left are what we typically see from September 1st through the end of February. The number is on the right. That's what we've seen so far this season. St. John's, again, uh, lagging well behind the average, as is Gander. But how about Stephenville and Blanc Sablon and even Cartwright near average, Happy Valley Goose Bay, way above average uh, for this time of year, 373 centimeters and counting. Now, St. John's, remember we were chasing that record, at least for a little while. Uh, we had it in our minds that uh, perhaps, perhaps we would uh, maybe see the one of the lowest snowfall uh, sea, snow, totals uh, uh, on record. We're out of that contention in terms of the lowest on record, which is 1982-83. 186 centimeters. We have now officially passed that, although maybe still landing in that uh, top five, top 10 in terms of lowest snowfalls on record seasonal. So we'll have to see where that blue line this year goes. If you want to take another look at this map, by the way, you can have a look at it. I've posted it on my Facebook page and on my Twitter feed also at cbc.ca slash Ryan Snodden. Okay, satellite and radar picture. Yeah, missing a bit of a bullet, a big bullet with uh, this system that has been passing well to our south. It is a monster storm. Uh, still, again, getting the winds from that. Wind warnings continue for the southern Avalon as well as the Buren Peninsula. Uh, that system will continue to track to the east. Winds will ease as it does. This area of high pressure off to the north will settle in. And then we're keeping an eye on our next system here, which is going to be brewing in as we roll towards the weekend time frame. Here's how it all plays out. Note those winds still gusting. 60, 70, 80 kilometers per hour through this evening. Even into tomorrow morning, likely still some gusts in that 60 to 70 range for the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula's temperatures near the freezing mark. Cooler for central west, lighter winds though, some gusts only to 40 and minus double digits to start the day for Happy Valley Goose Bay to Labrador City with some flurry chances. Note as we roll throughout the day tomorrow, clouds certainly dominant early on. A little more in the way of some sunshine, at least sprinkled in into the afternoon. Sun breaks uh, from the Bayvert Peninsula right down to the northern parts of the Avalon. More sun, of course, for the south coast, away from that onshore northeast wind. And note that's once again where we'll find our warmest temperatures, 2 to 3 degrees and more sunshine on the menu for the west coast, which again, it was a lovely day today. Nice day through the straits tomorrow. Some flurry chances for inland areas of Labrador tomorrow as well. And as we roll into the Thursday time period, this is where we'll really start to get into a better chance of seeing some sunshine on the menu. Lighter winds as well. Thursday is shaping up to be a pretty nice day as far as uh, March the 8th goes. Temperatures around the freezing mark, sun and cloud on the menu, and again, those lighter winds, minus 3 to minus 4 uh, for you folks in Labrador. Now, as into Friday's time period, we're going to see the clouds building back in, and our next system, it's knocking on the door. Close enough that I think we will see some flurry chances for Port Basque and the south coast. Everywhere else is increasing cloud cover through Friday, and our weekend system rolls in as we roll into the Friday night, Saturday time period. And it's going to be an interesting one. We'll have uh, more on that coming up in your long range forecast, Anthony. Well, thanks, Ryan. Now to beautiful Burgio on the south coast, where we've got several stories lined up for you in the coming weeks on here and now. But first up, the harbor. It's picturesque, but there are problems, and one of them is significant. It has safety ramifications for anybody who sails along the south coast. On my recent visit, I caught up with Burgio's harbor master, June Hiscock. So, June, what are some of the challenges of being the harbor master here? Oh, probably the biggest challenge we've been having the last couple of years is our travel lift. The marine travel lift that the Harbour Authority owns has fallen on disrepair. Right. And for people who don't know what a travel lift is, what does that thing do? 
The marine travel lift would take boats out of the water. Uh, fishing boats have to come out of the water to be inspected every year. They get lifted out and they do their work and uh, then they go back in the water. Sometimes we get calls from recreational boaters that need their boats lifted in too. And if you look around the parking lot, you know, we do have uh, vessels on our parking lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the issue of the lift, is it it's deteriorated, it's broken? It, it, it's uh, it's um, lots of repairs needed and no no money to repair. The federal government doesn't support these kinds of machinery anymore. Right. And uh, the Harbor Authority bought it themselves in 2004. It, we, when something breaks, it gets fixed when, you know, and uh, right now we've uh, found out that there's probably 80 to $100,000 worth of repairs. Oh. We do not generate enough money to be paying for these. Uh, one of the really important things, it, this doesn't just affect fact the community of Burgio because we've lifted boats from Porta Basque down to France Way. Okay, so it's a south um, coast issue. It's a south coast issue, but it, it's even bigger than that really, Anthony, because Arbor Breton has closed down their travel lift in the past. Really, there's no place to get your boat out of water from well, Port Saunders has a big northern boat repair and a lift service, right. and down the coast you would go to to fortune to so That's we, quite a ways. and there was a feller stranded in La Poil for a very very long time this summer mm -hmm. um, he wasn't able to get out of the water uh, and it, it is a big safety concern of course uh, we would really like to have a travel lift here it brings all kinds of visitors to our community and so it doesn't only benefit our fishers uh, you know it benefits the whole community because anybody who's visiting they visit Sailors. the grocery store, yeah. they go to get gas, the liquor store, you check know, Burgio out. Uh, to check Burgio out. A lot of them uh, come and see the beautiful place and they stay mm. and they're telling their friends and yeah. So let me ask you this question. Obviously being a harbour master comes with a few headaches. You live in St. John's for many, many years. Why would you come back to Burgio? I came back to, Bur to Burjo in 2005 to be with my mom. My mom was 83 at the time and uh, God love her. She needed someone to live with her or be moved into a home. And so I gave up my life in St. John's and came home to be with her in her last seven years. Mm -hmm. She lived to be 90. Mm -hmm. She uh, and you and, stayed and and well, I stayed. I love my community. I'm 60 years old now. I I didn't want to go back to St. John's or another big city to look for a job, and I have been trying to make my living here because I've always loved it and always stayed in close contact with it, even right. though I lived in right. lived away for many years. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Enjoy Burjo while you're here. Thank you. I can see why she loves it there, That's and gorgeous. you did too. Oh, it's, when you, it's stunning. That was your first visit my there. My first, and yeah. hopefully not my last. Yeah. It's beautiful, fantastic. Now getting back to the lift, mm -hmm. very expensive yeah, to repair be. it. Uh, right. Are there any solutions? Well, the federal government's not really interested in looking at projects $200,000, $250,000, but June did tell me that there's a glimmer of hope that ACOA might have some funds to assist, yeah. maybe with some kind of truck lifting capacity, a different way of getting boats in and out of the water. So who knows? We'll just have to keep our eyes on it for sure. The St. John's Edge are getting ready for four big basketball games and to tell us just how important these games are, we're going to be joined by associate coach Steve Marcus. That's coming up.
farming on the banks of the Humber River. We return to Riverside, Monday at 7. Welcome back. Well, why don't we head back to mile one now where the St. John's Edge is soon going to hit the hardwood against an important team, the Halifax Hurricanes. It's a matchup of two of the best teams in the league. They haven't played each other since the second game of the season. But this game means a lot more to both teams. Actually, the next four are going to be important to the edge. Jeremy Eaton joins us again. So, Jeremy, just how big are the next four games? Well, these four games, Debbie, are very important because as right now, Halifax is in the first place in the Atlantic Division, London's in the first place in the Central Division, but St. John's is hot on their heels. Now, just to explain how important, we're joined by associate head coach, associate to the head coach, assistant coach, Steve Marcus. Steve, how important is tonight's game against the Halifax Hurricanes? It's huge. You know, all year, Jeremy, we've been talking about playing our best basketball in March. Uh, March is here. Uh, we started that off our sixth game homestand with two victories against Kitchener. Um, you know, the next, this next game against Halifax is huge, but we're going to take it one game at a time and try to go 3-0 on our six-game homestand uh, tonight. Now, you're trailing the London Lightning. You're one game back right now, and so after you have this two your back to back games against Halifax, you've got two games coming up this weekend against London. How hard are you and the coaching staff working to get the team ready for those two big games as well? Yeah, you know, we're always working hard, but right now our focus is on Halifax and trying to, uh, trying to win tonight. We're not trying to get ahead of ourselves. Um, you know, and the most important game for us tonight is tonight against Halifax. So how important is it uh, to finish in first place in the Central Division? What does that mean going forward into the playoffs, Steve? It's huge. It's huge. You know, we have the best home court advantage in the entire league. You know, Mile One Center has been great to us. The City of St. John has been great to us. Um, and we feel that if we have home court advantage throughout the playoffs, this place will be, you know, jam-packed to the goals and it'll be rocking. You were, uh, you were here on the bench just behind us for Carl English's 58 point performance on Saturday night. So uh, what was your take on that? What do you think about that event? It was, a, it was a special night. It was a special night. You know, obviously Carl being from here, um, but he's one of the most prolific shooters I've ever been around. Uh, 58 points in any league in the world is unreal, but it was a special night to be a part of. So I got to ask now, you're originally from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and this is your first time in St. John's. What's your experience been like in this city, Steve? I've loved it. I've had so much fun. I've had family come up. My mom and dad are coming this weekend, so I'm excited to show them that. Um, but it's a great city. You know, the restaurants, the people, it's been, uh, it's been unreal for us. You know, the, the city's open, welcomed us with open arms. Um, and we're just, we're happy to be here. Well, man, and we're happy to have you here. We appreciate your time so much, Steve. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so, much. Yep. so this is Associate Assistant Coach Steve Marcus. I haven't figured out what the difference is yet. And they're getting ready to play the Halifax Hurricanes in about 19 minutes. So reporting live from Mile One Center on Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. And thanks very much to Jeremy. And uh, we're going to take you now just up the road from mile one to that well-known and sometimes very confusing intersection we've been talking about this week, Rollins Cross. Yeah, that's right. We told you last night that the city is trying to find a way to cut down on accidents in that area. And as part of that, a short section of Military Road is going to be closed to traffic. There'll be more crosswalks are going to be installed, as well as traffic lights that are going to be removed. We dug into our archives to see what the intersection looked like in the past. This is 1946, and you'll notice cars are driving the reverse of what we're used to today. They stay to the left side of the road. That's right. Our here and now crack research team <laughs> tells us that the switch to the right side of the road happened a year later on January 2nd, 1947. That must have been yeah. a confusing it's, time. <laughs> yes, it's 2018 and people are still driving on the wrong side. <laughs> it's Rollins Cross. It, it could be confusing. Oh, I love looking Vintage at that vehicles, footage. Vintage vehicles, right? <laughs> it's night. Well, I had the ch uh, lucky opportunity to go and visit another school today, McDonald Drive Elementary. Lots of great questions. I'll uh, fill you in on some of them after the break.
Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is Jacob Cox. Jacob is five and lives in Harbour Breton. And he plays with the Harbour Breton Hurricanes and it looks like he just might be a Toronto Maple Leaf fan. Do you see that somewhere? I don't. <laughs> it's like I spy with my little eye. Right. Although where's, it is a nice jersey. Where's Waldo? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a Leaf game on in the background. Anyway, uh, Jacob, congratulations. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's. Helping the world hear better. I think your mic was cut off there. You said the socks. I think it might be his socks, yeah. but we couldn't see very much. Yeah. Anyway. Or his underwear, but we can only see so much in that picture. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so... I was on the go again today, mm -hmm. and this time my travels took me actually just down the road to McDonald Drive Elementary, the grade fives, and they were keeners, so why don't we let them say right. hi first? One, two, three. You're watching here now, CBC, Go Hawks! Go Hawks! <laughs> You're a good crowd. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Couple All of the grade classes? fives. Oh, yeah, I yeah. believe there's three classes oh, there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's always a, a challenge when kids all get into a big group like that. But, uh, yeah. again, I mainly talk to grade fives. They've all been Lots great this year. Lots of big smiles. Year. There's that dancer guy I was talking about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's Somebody uh, doing a little <laughs> jig there. And there hasn't been much to jig about, given that I've only delivered, delivered one snow day since Christmas. <laughs> Despite that, everybody's in good spirits and friendly to me. Good. Lots of smiles. Good. You never know, right? Especially with the teachers. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, what's that, Roddy? More polar bears? Sure. If you've got them. Oh, oh right. Nice. I forgot about my own picture. Yeah, so this was uh, a great, of course, we had polar bears earlier in the show. And uh, I love this one because, uh, well, what are they fishing for? Maybe some more snow, which was my segue <laughs> into the weekend uh, forecast and the mess that will be. Uh, this was uh, courtesy of Patricia Kerford Bath and uh, her little one there. And Poppy were out uh, and made this beautiful, beautiful uh, snow sculpture. That's pretty creative. Well done. Can't yeah. make that on the Avalon. <laughs> no, definitely not. And so my sweetie. segue here was going to be that some of us really love the snow. And for those folks, well, uh, perhaps some good news coming for the weekend. Uh, for those who don't like the snow, well, only a couple more weeks, really. Uh, maybe maybe a few more weeks, because then that uh, extends it a little bit further. Uh, we are, of course, uh, not even into Sheila's brush territory quite yet. Uh, still a few weeks from that. Here's how it's all going to play it over the next couple days. So this has been our big low conduct conducting the traffic in terms of those winds that have been rolling in from the northeast over the last couple of days. Again, we really dodged a bullet here. This could have been significant snow that did track to our south. That low pulls away as we roll in through the day on Wednesday. You can see where that dominant northerly flow continues. That's going to keep temperatures cool, a little bit warmer for the west and southwest coast and into Labrador. Pretty nice day shaping up there as well. Wouldn't rule out some sunny breaks right along that northeast coast tomorrow. A little bit drier air coming in. Uh, more so for Thursday, though, as that high will really kind of expand and allow some sunshine to move in. Winds will be even lighter on Thursday, and that's the pick of the week for sure in terms of both the sun and the temperatures riding around the freezing mark for Newfoundland and slightly below freezing for Labrador. Now, into the Thursday afternoon and Friday time period, our next system will start to approach. It's actually a one-two punch. The first one uh, does not reach us. This is going to be just for the Maritimes. The secondary low will develop for Thursday night and in through Friday. And that is one of the first tricks to the forecast and trying to nail this down is the low that will be impacting us really doesn't develop for another two days. And once it does develop, well, the track is obviously going to be very, very key. Uh, forecast models anywhere from rolling it up over Nova Scotia to south of Newfoundland. That said, pretty good consensus that we will see an initial band of snow tracking in for Friday night in through Saturday. How much snow is in this band of snow? Well, it still remains to be seen. But 
expect snow Friday night into Saturday, and then it looks like we may see some mixing as we roll into the Saturday night Sunday period over southeastern parts of Newfoundland with the snow continuing for central and west. That mixing may continue even right through Sunday. Maybe another round back to snow on Monday. At least that's kind of what the thinking is right now. But lots of uncertainty here, so we're a long way uh, from uh, nailing down any specific totals. But if you have some weekend travel, expect impacts in terms of snow falling, snow on the roads, certainly right across the island, perhaps even into extreme southeastern parts of Labrador. But again, too early for totals. Just know that uh, this will be impacting us a long duration event that sets up from Friday night through Saturday into Sunday and Monday. The best chance of mixing will certainly be for the Avalon and the Buren Peninsulas and the better chance of straight up snow for the northeast coast, central and lighter snowfalls looking set for western parts of Newfoundland with this system. And again, a few flurries into southeastern parts of Labrador and Happy Valley Goose Bay, but a very quiet forecast continues for you folks in Labrador. You've got enough snow anyway. I think you would even you would agree with that. That's your forecast to now, Debbie. Thank you, Ryan. In national and international news tonight, a former Russian double agent and his daughter are in critical condition in a hospital in the UK. Police are now investigating whether they may have been poisoned. Focus has been on trying to establish what has caused these people to become critically ill and whether or not criminal activity has taken place. The two fell unconscious on Sunday after coming into contact with an unknown substance. Sergei Skripal was convicted by Moscow of spying for Britain. He is one of four Russian spies involved in a prisoner exchange with the U.S. in 2010. Britain has threatened to respond against Russia if it is implicated in the incident. North Korea is willing to talk about getting rid of its nuclear weapons, but only if its safety can be guaranteed. The comments come after Kim Jong-un held talks with a delegation from South Korea in Pyongyang yesterday. North Korea is pushing for closer ties after the historic meeting happened. The leaders of the two countries have also uh, agreed to meet at a summit next month. Relations between Pyongyang and Seoul have warmed of late. Both Koreas marched together under a united flag at the Winter Olympic Games. A Russian military transport plane has crashed in Syria, killing all 39 people on board. The Soviet-era plane, like the one shown here, went down at Russia's main air base on the Syrian coast. Officials from the Defense Ministry says, uh, say all of the dead were military personnel. There is speculation the crash may have been caused by a technical fault. Moscow says it is investigating. Protein is a buzzword in the food and health industry these days, and now there's a new unusual source available at local grocery stores. It may not go down easily for you, but for millions of people in other parts of the world, it's a common part of their diet. Jessica Doria Brown explains. Everyone loves free samples at the grocery store, but today something a little different. Granola bars made with powdered crickets. It is something new to, to Canadians, but I think uh, within time, it'll be something that'll be more common, but it is something <laughs> to definitely for us to get used to. Two and a half tablespoons of this powder gives you 13 grams of protein, 100% of your vitamin B12 for the day. The powder is also full of fiber, calcium and iron, but what about the taste? You know how some things taste kind of medicinal or something? It, it doesn't have that taste. It has a very nice, chocolatey, smooth taste and a bit of a crunch. Uh, I like the taste of it. I like the crunch. I guess that's the crickets. <laughs> and it's not just about taste or protein. It's about being green. Farming crickets for human consumption leaves a smaller footprint environmentally than more traditional protein sources like beef, pork or poultry. At least 2 billion people worldwide eat insects regularly. Here in Canada, retailers offering them in a powdered form makes this new to us protein source seem a lot more accessible. I don't know, it doesn't seem so bad when it's all done up like this. <laughs> it's uh, something that you can incorporate into um, your cooking and baking. So topping on top of oatmeal, yogurt, uh, incorporating to baked goods, soups, chilies, granola bars, energy bites, smoothies. And though the thought of eating crickets didn't seem to bug most people, it certainly isn't for everyone. 
Jessica Doria Brown, CBC News, Charlottetown. All right. Uh, in a battle of tech giants, BlackBerry is suing Facebook over text messaging technology. The patent infringement lawsuit also includes companies that are owned by Facebook. That includes WhatsApp and Instagram. In a statement, BlackBerry says although it is open to a future partnership, it invented some of the messaging capabilities currently used by the social media apps, making it BlackBerry's intellectual property. Facebook has responded and it's not backing down. In a statement, the company says, having abandoned its efforts to innovate, BlackBerry is now looking to tax the innovation of others. We intend to fight. All right, our viewer picture of the day. It was pretty. Yeah, beautiful oh, shots. Yes. And that. West Coast? Postcard perfect. No, Northeast Coast. Really? And a nice Look, is it a cabin? A nice home, anyway. You can see the big windows. Beautiful shot. Northeast. Mm. Yeah. Northeast coast, yeah. Uh, Spaniards Bay. No, good guess. Oh. Further west. West. Yeah. Why must you toy with me? <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, you might remember, we spoke about the massive storm that whipped through some northeastern states on the weekend. Yeah, you got to see this. Just take a look at this monster wave that hit homes in Brant Rock, Massachusetts. Oh, my goodness. Boom. One of the downsides of owning a beautiful beachfront property, it's so big the house in the middle disappears from view. Yeah. Honey, you wanted the view. <laughs> During the height of the storm, winds apparently clocked at close to 150 kilometers an hour. And I guess, uh, Ryan, is that hurricane? Absolutely, yeah. that's hurricane strength, yeah. Wow. Uh, what beach, though? I don't imagine there's much of a beach left. In fact, a lot of pictures of so much erosion. Uh, they're going to have to dump a ton of fill back in to replace the beach that's been washed, washed away, away in a lot of those areas. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to our viewer picture of much the day, calmer. much calmer, a beautiful shot. Now, I did give the clue of the northeast, and this is actually not far from. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, right in the Eastport Salvage area, which is a favorite spot of Mr. Germain. I'll never hear the end of this. Yeah, <laughs> this is Traytown. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. I see it now. Perfect. I've never seen it from that angle at that That's time right. of the evening. Uh, it's so beautiful it's there gorgeous. and that picture demonstrates it doesn't yeah. it i've kayaked there it's great just near clover town yeah. beautiful shot 
Thanks, Penny. Nice. Thanks very much. So many great pictures. You can't wait yeah. to get back, can you? Actually, <laughs> 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 only a couple more months. Yeah. Thanks for being with us. Good See night. you tomorrow. Good night.